Hey, Mike. How you doing today? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for joining me. It's an honor to have you on the show. Yes, yeah, nice to be here. So it's been about maybe three and a half years since I uh, participated in any powerlifting training. But during that time, I heavily consumed your content. And even now, as I transition to prioritizing bodybuilding, I would say that a lot of the principles that you've popularized or your challenges to traditional notions of periodization, they, they've really stuck with me, even with my bodybuilding training. So I think a good way to introduce this podcast would be to start with a, a nice little overview of what Emerging Strategies is, uh, its origins, and basically what you're trying to achieve with this or make up for the insufficiencies of traditional models of periodization. Probably the main thing that I'm trying to get at is better knowledge and having a better picture of what an athlete responds to. Uh, we know that individuals respond differently and that you need different things uh, in certain situations, but what those are is not always as we would expect. Otherwise, it would be pretty easy to algorithmically run a program. Um, so I, I always wanted to do what I could to not take a whole lot for granted there and uh, to let the athlete's training response drive the, the decisions. So um, where we end up going with that is, is kind of uh, what would we need to do to get better information back out of the system? Uh, and I think holding a lot of variables constant or nearly constant uh, reduces the, the noise in the system a lot. Now, I don't think the week-to-week -week variability really gives you all that much benefit either, you know, uh, to switch exercises, you know, from one week to the next or to like rotate back and forth between these two exercises. And then uh, this other movement slot rotates between three different exercises and Earlier on in my career, I used to kind of pride myself on not having uh, two weeks of training that looked alike. You know, uh, there was always something a little bit different, a tweak here or there. Um, but I don't think that that really gets you very far. Does that make sense? Oh, it absolutely does. Yeah, that's what I think is truly compelling about the strategy is that you're trying to minimize as much noise as possible in order to understand what the athlete is basically responding best to within the training program. And I'm sure mm -hmm. you'll, you'll at least be generally familiar with this in terms of the popular strategies for hypertrophy training, but it's kind of died off, but there was heavy interest in increasing hard sets from week to week. And even within while I was consuming your content and transitioning to hypertrophy, it's something that I've played around with, but, but never really appealed to me, especially when we're looking at something like increasing sets from like 10 week, 10 sets in week one, all the way up to 20 sets over the course of a block. Like that's a pretty dramatic increase in volume. And, and to that point, there's a lot of noise in there. Like when, when was the adaptation best? Was it at 13 sets? Was it at 19? Like, I, I think it's very difficult to analyze that data and make any predictions about what's actually working. Even if you're keeping all of the exercises constant within that time frame. And, that, and as you alluded to, people might be uh, mixing, mixing those up as well, especially when it comes to hypertrophy, right? Because there, there are no must do exercises. Right, right. You know, one thing, one difficulty that you may have like applying an emerging strategy style framework to a hypertrophy situation is like, how do you benchmark the progress? Uh, for powerlifting, it's easy. You have some sort of performance in the competition movement and that either improves or it doesn't. Uh, 
and that's how you benchmark it. Uh, an estimated wall RM is a really handy uh, measurement, but we don't have measurements like widely available to let us know like, uh, are you actually growing muscle or not? Um, everything seems to be a proxy measurement. You know, even if you had access to, to lab equipment in most cases, you know, you're still dealing with a lot of proxy measurements, uh, maybe better proxies, but still proxies. I thought maybe one kind of accessible proxy measurement might be an isometric, mm -hmm. you know? So um, you can get, when I was moving, uh, like the spring of 2020, uh, the pandemic had all the gyms shut down. Uh, so like my home gym got packed up and moved. Uh, so there was like a three, four month period where I didn't have any gym access. So I was training like in my living room using like bands and uh, I got some toe straps and did some isometrics and stuff like that. But me being the, the data nerd that I am, I wanted to quantify my isometrics in some way. Like, am I getting stronger or not in this isometric contraction? Uh, and there's a device that, that I got uh, that's essentially like a strain gauge, uh, a load cell, I guess, uh, that hooks up to my computer and it'll output, it'll output that information to my computer so I can see like, okay, the contraction was this long, uh, the peak force was this much, the average, you know, whatever you want to figure out from that. Um, and I thought what you could do is use that same device to measure isometrics in whatever movements that you decided that you cared about from, uh, from a hypertrophy standpoint, probably something single joint isolation. You would only do this testing now and then because with an isometric like that, there's a really low skill component. And my understanding at least is that it correlates pretty well with uh, the amount of contractile tissue that you've got. So if you're adding more contractile tissue, then your isometric should get stronger. And so I haven't actually done that, uh, but I thought that that might be a, an interesting thing to try at some point. No, I love that. Have you ever ran like an experiment with some of your RTS lifters and, and perhaps uh, looked at the data comparing like their squat progress and then using something like maybe uh, a six to eight RM on, on leg extensions, uh, a similar, similar movement with a very low uh, skill component? No, I haven't done anything like that. So the thing was, so with training power lifters, it's going to always kind of come back to what is this correlated to movement in the competition lift or not you know so and if you're a power lifter usually doing competition movement mm -hmm. at least once a week or every other week is not a big ask they usually want to do it <laughs> anyway so so you know that would be an interesting thing to try though you know it might give you some insight on, you know, I mean, you could, I, I've run correlations, not that specific correlation, but I've run other correlations before, right? So like um, how tightly correlated is my two count pause squat to my competition squat or things like that, you know, and that, I think the best way to look at that is in context. And the best way to make sure that the, that data is in context is kind of through the block review process that we use. Um, the block review looks at the entire training block and says, so, so like in an emerging strategies program, kind of a doctrinal emerging strategies program, you can think of it like one training week that repeats. You know, same exercises, same reps, same RPEs the weight on the bar will fluctuate a little bit as you get stronger or weaker, um, but only as much as it needs to, to make sure that the RPE stays, stays the same. So then at the end of that, you can look at the, the block and kind of think of that whole uh, 
microcycle, that whole training week that repeats as one stimulus. Because it all kind of blends together a little bit, you know. Like if you do um, you know, bench press on day one and you do pin press on day two, and then maybe day three is a rest day, but day four you do incline bench and day five, you're not really fully recovered. It's not like a like these things will interact, you know. So it's best to really look at them as a, as a single stimulus. And I think the block review process does a good job of that. So then once you've accumulated a few block reviews, you can look at a meta block review and say, oh, okay, um, with my blocks that contain pause squats generally uh, have a better gain rate or a higher peak estimated one RM than blocks that contain pin squats, you know, or some, some other variation, safety bar, you know. So I think that block review process is probably the most ideal way to look at the correlations. And you made a recent post about that and, and found that for yourself with, I believe it was chain bench press. Whenever you throw that in your program, you, you seem to have some progress. And, and I love the caption because you more or less said like, I don't know why, but like, I got lots of data showing that this is what happens. <laughs> right. So it's interesting. So in the intervening time, I've maybe made some progress on figuring out why, you know, so the, we can look at this from a few different angles. One is that when I look at that meta block review, yeah, chain bench press outperforms lots of other movements for me. And it's important to say for me, because this is definitely not true for everybody. Uh, maybe not even the majority of lifters and some other anecdotes on that too. But um, if we look at the meta block of you, we see a chain bench press is good, but we see other exercises that are good too. And when I look at the list of good exercises, I notice that there's a commonality in, uh, they all kind of emphasize triceps. You know, so it might be dips, it might be benching with some kind of bands or close grips or something like that, but not all triceps movements, interestingly, because board press, floor press, stuff like that tends to not do so well. So triceps movements, but not necessarily partial range of motion triceps movements. So that's one angle to look at it from. And then uh, another angle is I've been working with this uh, company called Oral Muscles. And they're developing um, a small EMG device. So you can hook this thing up to whatever muscle that you want. You know, it's, it's really small uh, and portable. And, uh, you know, I know that they're, they're still developing kind of the way that they want it to be in the end. But uh, at this point, I'm just kind of collecting data so when we started off, you know, I was collecting uh, muscle activation data on my pecs, and then we did delts, and then, you know, of course, triceps. And through that process, you know, Hobie was able to uh, identify that my triceps were working the hardest, you know, which seemed like it might be the weak link, you know, like the, they reached full activation sooner. Uh, they were fully activated in, in more movements. And, you know, anyway, so like through our discussion, um, like it kind of seems like it might be triceps. And then I said, well, it's funny you mentioned that because when I look at the block reviews, I tend to get more at mileage out of triceps focused exercises. So maybe that is the case. And maybe that would explain why, um, you know, but to your point, you don't have to know why to make use of the information. You know, you can know, hey, I get a lot out of chain bench press. And if you never make it past that point, you still know that you get a lot out of chain bench press and you can use that information. Of course, knowing why gives you some additional power, but uh, you know, that almost always comes down the road a little bit. Have you had any blocks with a hefty dose of isolation work for your triceps at all? Not lately. 
I end up being fairly time constrained on a lot of things. I would, I'm, I want to, I want to trial something like that. Um, but I've got to get a couple things in place before I can, before I can do it. One thing I, I tell lifters and coaches is not to let systems limitations constrain their training options, you know, um, and then I'm not following my own advice here. <laughs> um, like, and what I mean by that is uh, I have some systems in place for managing my own training volume and, and workloads and recovery and stuff like that. And it's not quite built to do real well with isolation movements right now. I, this is all like uh, R and D kind of stuff that that I'm building and just kind of doing some self experiment with. So um, I want to build it out further so it can tolerate like a greater variety of things, but it's just not there yet. And in the meantime, I'm reluctant to to do something that I know will break the system. You know, and it, again, you shouldn't do that, but I'm doing it. <laughs> Within this emerging strategies framework and the desire to minimize noise to the greatest degree possible, we also have this concept sort of of like doing the same thing over and over again. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? And, and then when things, when progress does begin the plateau, we, we can always pivot to something else and, and, and rejuvenate the program. With that said, something that I'm fond of and, and I use with you know, a lot of people who are training primarily for body composition purposes are reactive deloads. So they just happen when something isn't working, right? We see a stall in progress. Maybe something's feeling a little iffy and okay, we'll, we'll throw in a deload week here. And even people within the like evidence-based bodybuilding space have like argued with me about this and my preference for it and something you see brought up a lot is like just a joint slash tendon wear and tear and like oh if, if you're feeling that like it's too late um but you know for me it's like within the space of bodybuilding where there's so much variety in our movement patterns we can do whatever we want all of the time um our our intensity in, ter in terms of load is going to be, you know, relatively uh, lower, at, le at least compared to powerlifters to the point where I'm like, I can see the precaution w when it comes to powerlifting, but in my experience, successfully using these people, and even just theoretically, I, I think it's hard to justify uh, proactive deloads for, for bodybuilders, especially when 9.9 .9 out of 10 times, every time you give one of these people a deload, they're pissed. Like they're like, I don't, I don't want to take any, I don't want more days off. So how it, in, in recent times, I don't know if your opinion has changed in a lot. How, how have you implemented deloads with your athletes? If you even use traditional deloads at all, maybe you just pivot to something else. Yeah. Well, maybe a bit of terminology, um, but we actually call them uh, pivot blocks. Okay. So like a normal training block, uh, is a developmental block and then usually it's separated by a pivot block now pivot block is characterized by uh, lower overall workloads mm -hmm. um, a, a big shift in movements and a, a reduction in intensity usually um, we're trying to accomplish five different things in a, in a pivot block. So like a development block is, has a singular focus, make me better at my sport. Mm -hmm. And a pivot block is like, okay, there's all this other stuff that I need to, to account for and make sure it isn't neglected in my pursuit of better sport. Um, and that's, you know, the other side of fatigue management. Um, sensitivity to training loads, which I think is, is a thing. Um, so reducing the overall workload can help restore even just a little bit of sensitivity to training load might mean that you don't have to 
you know, continually escalate train loads up and up and up, and up forever. Um, we want to maintain our strength, which is a big thing. Um, we know that we won't be able to maintain like 100% of peak strength, but even maintaining, you know, some fraction of that is, you know, ideal. We also want to uh, train neglected muscle groups, which would be less of an issue for you because you're not neglecting as much. Uh, but it's still probably a good idea to do some like basic movement skills that maybe don't lend themselves quite so strongly to a strong hypertrophic response. Like for us, for a power lifter, lots of times rows get skipped, ab work gets skipped, uh, knee flexion, hamstring exercises get skipped, um, things like that. So um, we can use the pivot blocks to, to do some of that training. And I don't think it's bad for you, you know? Yeah. Uh, and if they haven't been trained, then the capacities are probably fairly low and it just won't have a big cost to it at that point. And then the last thing is to improve durability. Um, I am a believer that doing a variety of movements, having a variety of movements, that even just that you have a basic competency in, uh, is going to make you more resilient as an athlete, you know, and it could be as simple as, you know, wide stance squats and narrow stance squats, like just a small variation to stance. You know, if the only thing that you ever do is squatting in the same stance over and over, that's a really narrow competency that's getting built. And what happens if you move outside of that competency? And I think there's, likely some benefit to doing that um and it, it could just be the mental break from from it you know I, I think that it's more than that but it it could be um at any rate we that's kind of how we structure the, the pivot blocks they're usually short um you know about a third the length of the development block so if your development block is six weeks we'll pivot for two weeks you know if you development blocks four weeks we'll pivot for one week you know so it's not a, a huge amount of time um but that's how we set them up and that kind of serves as our deload as well it's i think somewhere in between uh proactive and reactive deloading because we set the length of the development block based on athlete response you know as long as you're making progress we keep doing development work when progress stops then we do pivot work right so we notice that that's fairly stable within a decent range of training intervention. So if your uh, development block length is six weeks, then you would do development work for six weeks. And then we would do a small pivot and then another six week block and then pivot and so on. And that way it gets, it's not exactly reactive, but it's, we're, we're using the system to be predictive of when we would need a reactive deal. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's kind of somewhere in between, I think. Yeah, I, I definitely see what you're saying there, but that's all very interesting. Now, with this bottom-up periodization style, right, it, it's in contrast to these traditional uh, top-down approaches, right? We, we just saw the Olympics, and, and when it comes to top-down approaches, people probably like to think of, like, the Olympic training cycle, right? Like what it, what is the multi-year plan look like? And we're going to draw all of it up in advance, right? And we're going to have like these very precise wave loading patterns and, and everything just, just looks great on paper on a long-term scale. Whereas with emerging strategies, you kind of have like, yeah, we're going to deal with like the smallest segment of this plan, like just the micro cycle and, and kind of monitor that, which clearly these are entirely separate. They're almost complete opposites of each other, which brings us to uh, how how you came to this uh, general approach. I, I'm very curious to know about the sports scientists who have influenced your thought processes 
on programming and being familiar with your background, I had an idea uh, of Bondarchuk being uh, highly influential for you, but you made some notes in the outline and yeah. you included uh, Boris Shaiko or Shaiko. I'm still not sure which, which is the way you pronounce it, but uh, of course, like any coach in powerlifting is, is familiar with his work and sure. is influenced with him to some degree. But I think it's interesting because most people will know these programs from this prolific coach as being, you know, of course they differ depending on the athlete and, and there's all sorts of different programs that he's made, but usually they're dealing with like, you know, moderate to high volumes and like an average intensity somewhere in like the 70 to 75% range. Whereas with you, I, I think you're, you're more or less notorious for training being relatively heavy all of the time. Right. So I, I think for, for the listener, they might think what, what has Mike T really gotten from him? Right. Like how, yeah. how has he influenced his uh, methodology? Yeah. So that one in particular uh, was, I would say Shaka was influential on me uh, a couple of different ways. One is through increasing the frequency that I was training the movements. Um, prior to my exposure to Shaco, uh, most powerlifters were doing like two lower body movement, uh, two lower body workouts a week and two upper body workouts a week. Uh, more of a west sidey type of template. Um, I, there were a handful of people who kind of, people, there were a handful of Americans who jumped ship to some Shaco style programs early on, but there's a, there's a fairly different cultural background here, right? Like powerlifting culture in America was uh, primarily derived from bodybuilding culture. And you see that in some of the early programming, like in the you know, 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, but then uh, powerlifting culture in Russia, in many parts of Europe, is derived from weightlifting. And you see more of that approach. And it seems like what we've got going on right now, especially in America, uh, but it's, it's homogenized a lot thanks to the internet um, is, is somewhat of a hybrid, I would say. Uh, we've kept a lot of the weightlifting style understanding of um, you know, frequent practice of the movements and things like that. Like it's not uncommon for somebody to bench three, four or five times a week. Um, you know, there's wear and tear issues with the other movements, but you know, bench is a good example there. But then it's also not uncommon to do hypertrophy blocks. It's not uncommon to do uh, bodybuilding movements uh, because the, the stimulus to fatigue ratio is just more favorable. You know, so we've kept elements of both, but I would say for me, one of the ways Shaka was influential was uh, helping to promote the higher frequency stuff, which I, started experimenting with probably in like 2005 or six and it wasn't very common then um and then the other thing was is kind of an emphasis on training volume it took me a long time to understand what that gets you uh and and kind of what the purpose of it was but i mean lots of people even if they don't even if they're not like deep down sports scientists uh, understand that, you know, doing more volume is it's good up to a point, you know. Yeah, definitely. I, I think the topic of volume is something that's really interesting and per, perhaps, I think it's this way for both bodybuilding and powerlifting. There, there was more of a fascination of the association between training volume and both strength outcomes and muscle hypertrophy outcomes. Like a few years ago, people were just like, I'm, I'm going to do all of this volume and I'm going to get all of the results everywhere. And, and people have kind of backed off of that. So I, I would like to hear from you 
in terms of what training volume does get the athlete and how that can benefit their powerlifting performance in particular, because the general notions that, that seem to be thrown around, right. Is like even silver powerlifters, some of that back off volume work is going to be useful for, for muscle hypertrophy, but also there, there is a skill component and more exposures. Like you talked about that frequency from Shaco. I, I think something that can be somewhat puzzling in this is that, you know, if we compare powerlifting to something like weightlifting, these movements are relatively simple. And when we're looking at advanced athletes who have been lifting for years, it's like, how much exposure do we need to these three basic lifts? Like, right. So like if, if part of the improvement in performance is, is skill, it's like, it's, it's almost hard to believe that someone who's been squatting for 10 years needs to squat three times per week. And that skill increase is like benefiting the, their performance. It doesn't seem like they would get a lot out of that, but perhaps touch on for, for the listeners and, and maybe you can even focus on the advanced athlete here like what they have to gain from, from a little bit more volume, some, some more exposure for their powerlifting total. Yeah. I, on the surface, I see how the power lifts are mechanically more simple, like coordinative, coordinatively, I guess if that's the word, uh, from a coordination standpoint, they're more simple than something like weightlifts. But I, maybe I'm just not a very good athlete, <laughs> but I've been doing this for, I've been doing this since 97. And I mean, just this week, you know, I noticed a technical error that I've been making in the bench press, you know, and I haven't always been making it, but I started making it some weeks ago. My bench press has been kind of sluggish and not doing what I wanted to and I noticed this error and I'm correcting it now but I mean on the surface I understand that you know it's simple and that we should be able to perform it but I think the stronger you get the greater the precision required and it gets pretty ridiculous like the stuff that I've noticed the technical errors that I've noticed in myself over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years even, are not technical errors that I would necessarily notice on video. Maybe somebody with a keener eye than me might, but I, I don't notice them. I can feel that I'm making them though, and I can feel what the correction feels like. And they're, it's small, subtle things. You know, yeah, you should be able to perform the, the gross movement uh, proficiently. Um, and if you've had lots of practice, you probably don't, you're never gonna go back to like total novice uh, skill levels, you know, but what we're trying to do is to be incredibly precise with the skill. And I don't even think that that's a thing that you can get back in a couple months, you know, like a thought experiment that I was doing recently was along the lines of like, there has to be something more to it than just how much contractile material do you have and what's your skill level? Because at that point, every bodybuilder would be like, they could maximize their powerlifting results in like eight weeks of specialized powerlifting training. And I just don't think that's it. You know, I, I think there's, there's more to it. There's other adaptations that are important uh, and I think it probably takes longer than that to truly be at the skill level that you need to be to express, to fully express your strength. So I think that's off topic <laughs> from where you wanted to go with it. But I think that it's important to, to mention. So maybe you want to steer me back. No, I, I thought that was fantastic. And I actually want to travel down that road a little bit further sure. because to your point, then it sounds like to me that this all means that yes technical precision becomes more important as you become an extremely uh talented lifter an advanced lifter who who lifts heavy weights mm -hmm. like just you know a, a small degree of error 
can completely sabotage a lift. So, so to me, that sounds like, well, we need to get this lifter exposed to really heavy loads as frequently as they can tolerate in order to maximize their performance, which again, then brings in the question for me, what is this person gaining with these back off sets of five at RP five? Like, how is that making them a better lifter? And we can go back to the hypertrophy thing. And like you mentioned, it's probably a little more complicated than that, but. This is it. This is your, you're right there. You're exactly on target. But, but also for an advanced lifter, right They they probably don't have much more muscle to put on. Like does Russell or he have more muscle to put on? Like, I, I, I think he's maxing out his weight class, you know, yeah. like what, what, what's he doing with these back off sets of five RP five, Mike. So, well, I mean, that's a really good point, right? So there's lots of things that you can be gaining from this, right? You're doing some training. Uh, there, there's a lot of potential training effects, I should say. And will the question that we have is, will that training effect cause your 1RM to improve? And I think that's an open question. That's something that you kind of have to measure. And that's like the emerging strategy system seeks to measure that because it's hard for me to say, you know, well, could you add a little bit more contractile material? Maybe, maybe you can get a little bit more hypertrophy. Um, and I don't really know how much muscle do you have to put on to add five pounds to your bench? You know, how much muscle do you have to add to the pecs? Like, is it perceptible even, you know, or can you add like this, imperceptible amount of muscle and your bench goes up five pounds because now there's a little more contractile material there. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but I think also we have to leave room for stuff that we don't fully understand yet. You know, like uh, lateral force transfer is the thing that gets talked about now, but it, if you go back a few years, it was not a thing that we really acknowledged especially as practitioners. And I, I mean, I, I knew researchers at the time, they weren't really talking about it a lot either, you know? So it makes me think like, is there anything else out there like that, that, that is potentially important or potentially meaningful that we're just not thinking about that much right now? Um, which is again, that I think a, a justification for the pragmatic approach of saying, Hey, let's do this thing and see if it makes an impact on my 1RM. So I think you can do, given that the skill component is important, and I think you can almost take that to something like an axiom in, uh, if we're talking about like powerlifting training philosophy, uh, the skill of competing powerlifting is important and it takes time to develop it. Um, it at least doesn't hurt. It doesn't cost you that much to consistently have something uh, fairly specific in the program. It doesn't have to be a lot, but like uh, the single at 8RPE is something that I use a lot, but even that we don't use it year round necessarily. And it doesn't have to be a single, it doesn't have to be a certain RPE even, but it's a good example because it's the competition lift. It's done for a single, it's fairly heavy. It's a good barometer for your progress. It's a good skill development tool. And so that's why we use it a lot. So even if I was to build a hypertrophy block, I would still include something like that in there because it doesn't take away that much. You know, it doesn't cost you that much in terms of training time. It's not especially fatiguing. You know, it's, it, it's one working set really, uh, maybe two if you're gonna count some of your warmups. Uh, so it's not costing you that much in terms of your total volume for the week or anything, but it gives you a really good barometer. So over the course, say again, you're a power lifter and you're doing this hypertrophy block. Well, do you need hypertrophy or not? You know, uh, is that your limiting factor or not? Well, we have to, in the beginning, we, we would have to say we don't know. So if you're doing this hypertrophy block, but including some skill component, then one, the skill can be fairly standardized. You know, like you, we can assume that you're not gaining 
large amounts of skill or losing large amounts of skill if you're practicing it at least once a week, you know. But so if we notice that, hey, I'm doing this hypertrophy block and I'm getting stronger from week to week, then that's a good indication that the hypertrophy block is doing something for you. Um, similarly, like sets of five and a five RPE, I guess you would think of that like lower level technique work, you know, and from a theoretical standpoint, I don't think that that's very valuable to most people. I just don't think so. Um, but if you did a training block and you did that kind of work and your lifts went up, look, that that's a good example from a coaching standpoint for myself and a lot of the other coaches on the RTS staff, we don't like that, <laughs> you know, like we don't necessarily like those super low RPE stuff. We wouldn't like it for ourselves. We're a little bit meathead at heart. You know, we want to train heavy. We want to train hard. And that just doesn't, it just doesn't feel very exciting. And we've had several clients come to us and be like, hey, I want to try this. Okay, let's try it. I don't, like in our heads, we're thinking, I don't think this is going to work, but I also don't know. So let's kick over the rock and we'll see, you know. Um, so we try it and we've had more than a few lifters who surprisingly to us responded very well to it. Of course, not everybody, uh, but for those lifters who do respond well to it, we go, huh, well, you know, I learned something too here. So now we have a tool that we can use that's effective for this lifter. You know, it's clearly providing something that they need, you know, um, and then we can figure out what that is later, I guess. But like I've kind of gone the other way a little bit on rate of force development work over the years that for a while I didn't think it was very valuable. And I certainly didn't think it was valuable from like the standpoint of helping a lifter generate more force. But I think it kind of went too far. Uh, and, and I do see some value in, in RFD work now. I, I would tend not to take it as far as like five RPE, at least for myself. Um, but like six, seven RPE, sure. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah, the, the low RPE work and you know how that's going to increase rate of force development and there being a carry over there. I guess that is one of the things, right, of, of why we might use this back down work because if we put you on a force plate, you know, your your first attempt at a meet and, and your third attempt probably aren't going to be that different in terms of force you're producing. So if we have a load that is at least like the minimum of this strength threshold, like 75%, and you're putting out, you know, you're, you're lifting the load with maximal intent, like there should be some sort of, of positive adaptation there that can transfer. But again, you know, when we get to those high RP maximal loads that can completely change your technique and skew things to where it's like, would that low RP work still really like have that transfer? You know, it, it's kind of a difficult yeah. concept to process. Well, there's a, I mean, specificity is such an interesting thing, right? Like we tend to think of specificity much too simply, you know, that if a movement looks generally like the movement that I'm doing in competition, then it's specific, but it can be specific, more specific in one dimension, less specific in another. And I think the, the repetitions is a good way to highlight that, you know, that, you know, you take a, a single at five RPE versus a single at nine RPE, which one's more specific? Well, well, okay, singles is not gonna illustrate the point. So let's say triples at five versus triples at nine. Well, triples at five, you're going to continue to have fairly high force output uh, for, for all three reps. Um, will it be as high? Probably not because there's something, uh, the, your rate of force development matters and if it's, move, if it's too easy, then the bar is moving too fast for you to generate maximal levels of force output. So that's something else to be aware of. But uh, then the triple at nine RPE, 
the last repetition is slow and grindy, um, which looks more specific. But if you consider that last repetition, you know, you've got fatigue from the two prior repetitions, which isn't as specific. So it can be more specific in one, in one way, like the duration of the contraction, you know, the speed of the contraction, uh, but less specific in another way, the fact that you're uh, contracting under fatigued conditions, you know, uh, that you're not getting a, a full motor unit pool to draw from, you know, because some motor units uh, have dropped out due to fatigue. So, you know, when you start thinking of specificity that way, then it opens a lot of things up too. So uh, what's more specific, you know, a two count pause squat or a pin squat? Well, it kind of depends on what perspective you want to look at it from. Like that's too broad of a question to just take by itself, right? Like for me, I think a, a pin squat is more specific in terms of um, reducing the chest fall pattern. Like you really have to focus on the, the chest fall pattern, um, the good morning squat, uh, so that you don't kind of fall into that pattern and have low performance. The, the pause squat won't require that as much, but will require more in terms of bracing in the bottom. You know, so it, it, it can be more specific in one way and less specific in, a, in another way. And, you know, that extends to the competition movement as well. Like you could be doing a, a competition squat for sets of five or a two count pause squat for a single, you know? I mean, now we've got several different factors all, all in play at the same time. And it's, it's important to think about stuff like that. And I mean, that's like, I don't mind doing heavy singles in, uh, what we call SDE movements uh, or developmental exercises. So think like the heavier types of assistance exercises like pin squats or uh, long pause benches or close grip benches or deadlifting with chains, something like that. I don't mind taking those for singles because lots of times they're selected for some skill that they emphasize, you know, and by doing something that's very high intensity relative to that movement, you know, it, it kind of highlights that skill component that you're trying to develop. So let's say that you're working on your bar path in the bench and you choose a low incline bench press, like a 15 degree incline bench press. If you are using a very heavy weight, then that highlights that skill component that you're that you're trying to bring out with that movement, and I think that's a a good thing to do. So um, it it can look funny to people uh, that aren't used to it to like to do you know a heavy single in the incline bench press. Like what is this West Side? Well, honestly, I mean I think that's something that that they do right. You know, is taking heavier weights in non-competition exercises. I think there's some value there. On your most recent point there, do you find that the use of variation in particular to target weaknesses, whether that be muscle group specific or within the movement pattern itself, as you gave an example of there with a, a chest fall pattern and a squat, do you find that these variations become uh, more or less valuable depending on the training status of the lifter so like for example have you yeah. found that when an advanced lifter comes to you that you know they might benefit more from really targeting these weak points whereas like you know that that intermediate lifter doesn't need to worry about that so much or, or what have you found there yeah i mean that touches on something we started to touch on the topic or two ago um when it comes to improving technique for a lifter, it again, it's got to be in context. So the thing that you really care about is your technique under competition conditions. So with near maximal weights, um, you know, in the competition movements and 
all the other competition conditions that are relevant. The maximal weights part is the thing that I think a lot of people forget. And to just like anything else, if you want to improve a quality, you have to work that quality and you work it by presenting some sort of challenge, you know, and then the adaptation uh, helps you to overcome that challenge. We're leveraging that adaptive response. The same holds true for technique work. So the idea of doing something very light uh, for technique work is fine if, you know, if that's presenting a technical challenge to you. You know, like if you think about a novice lifter who's like struggling with basic coordination stuff, it doesn't have to be hard for them to, you know, be focusing on, you know, breaking at the hips at the right time and how far should they push their knees over their toes or not. And, you know, uh, the coordination sequence of coming out of the hole and, you know, and like all these different things, it doesn't have to be that heavy to present the challenge for them in that way. You know, so for them, I think doing lighter work is developmental for technique. But if you take a, a more advanced lifter, that stuff isn't a challenge, that's second nature. They just do it, you know. But when the weight gets sufficiently heavy, then you have compensation patterns that can kick in. Some of those need to be remedied at like a mental cognitive level, like, oh, I need to think about, you know, squeezing my this or driving first with my that. Okay, fine. Um, a lot of times though, I find that they are limited by, by strength, really. You know, you get a chest fall pattern in the squat because your quads aren't strong enough to produce the required amount of torque. So you have this compensation pattern that kicks up to move the load to some, some muscles that can help you complete the lift, you know? you don't just will yourself out of that, you know, or if you do, you'll take a hit on your 1RM. Um, you have to develop the weak muscle group so that it can produce a required amount of torque. And then you have to transfer that. Uh, so you, let's develop the weak muscle group. Let's say that that uh, is akin to adding contractile tissue. So you do a hypertrophy block and now you've got more quad size. Okay, great you've got to then translate that into, um, it's got to go through coordination to be brought to use, right? And that's where like training the competition lift comes in. But that's also where I think the SDE movements fit in these developmental exercises, because you can select a movement, you know, we're talking about chest ball pattern in the squat, you can select a movement that is particularly challenging to that mechanic. You know, think like a safety bar squat. You know, it's trying to pull you forward. It's trying to make this chest ball pattern a bit worse. So you have to really focus. Uh, you have to really fight that tendency. Um, but it doesn't, it taxes that mechanic more, but it taxes other mechanics a bit less. So it lets you focus on the thing that you're trying to focus on. Um, and then training the competition movement itself becomes a way to integrate it all together. So I think development of technique should go through this pattern as well, where you're presenting a challenge to technique. And the more proficient you get, the more difficult that challenge has to be uh, for it to be a challenge. You know, training at 50% won't be a challenge you know, once you pass some level of proficiency. Absolutely. I, I know we're coming up on time here. Do you have like 15 minutes to talk about hypertrophy blocks? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I was listening to your podcast this morning on hypertrophy blocks on my walk. And from, from what I'm gathering, you know, these definitely aren't a mainstay of how RTS programs and if you guys do utilize quote unquote traditional hypertrophy work, you know, thinking of squats and bench presses for like sets of eight to 10, you're doing it because 
you found that that elevates what you care about, which would be this estimated one RM. And, and that's kind of a question in itself that we'll come back to. But following that, I guess I just want to ask is that even though you generally don't use them, like, are there any situations where, you know, you might just look at a lifter or consider their training status, whether it be novice or intermediate and, and kind of say, this person could benefit from like a pretty traditional hypertrophy block. Does that ever occur within your programming? I guess I would need you to define for me a little bit. Like, what do you mean by a traditional hypertrophy block? So if we consider like block periodization, right? Mm -hmm. Where, you know, we have that preparatory phase. And as an example, I would say like, yeah, maybe the lifter squats three times per week. Like they're going to be doing like tens on one day, eights on one day and six on another day. Like it's not going to be tens, mm -hmm. fives and twos, like, they really focus on eliciting this specific adaptation. Again, traditional block periodization, like then we're going to move the strength and it's going to be like three to five. And then in peaking, we're going to do one to three. Do you yeah. ever like really hone in and, and concentrate that much on just like one rep range for yeah. hypertrophy at least? Yeah, yeah. So as a strategy, now my go-to biases are going to nudge me to keep something fairly heavy in that in that structure but again like it's one or two sets a week where we're gonna continue to have like you know a, a moderate single or something like that just to benchmark the performance but i've definitely written programs where outside of that everything else was six plus repetitions you know and the thing is to me that will either cause the one RM to go up or it won't. Um, and that'll tell me what I need to know on whether this lifter uh, should continue doing things like that or not. So you don't, so you don't get a lifter and like they're an 83, but like, like they're small, right? Like when you look at like, when you look at, you know, some, some top of the class or even just like their body weight as a whole, they might be mm -hmm. like a, a solid 78 in an 83, but you can tell they don't have enough muscle on them sure. to be, you know, their most competitive self. Like you don't have that person and go like, maybe you should do some, some eights because you need to get more <laughs> jacked. Like you say, no, we're going to do some eights because your estimated one RM goes up. And that's what I care about. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially. Like, I, I, don't, okay. I don't think that, I mean, take your example from a theoretic standpoint, I would agree with you that that person needs some improvements in muscle size um, to be their most competitive, mm -hmm. but there's a number of assumptions that would come along with that. And I think that, that if those assumptions are true, then the 1RM should respond, you know, in pretty short order. Like the, the idea of doing the hypertrophy block and then doing the uh, strength block to uh, transition that stuff, uh, the additional hypertrophy into uh, strength quality. I don't think that that needs to be separated by a large span of time. I think if you're training both qualities at the same time, that you know, the muscle that you add will be coordinated pretty quickly because you're training uh, skill work on a pretty consistent basis anyway. Um, so again, like how much muscle do you need to add to make their bench go up five pounds? I don't know. Maybe it's a lot, maybe it's a little, but um, if we're monitoring, you know, it, it, it could be that the adaptation that we're getting from six or eight repetitions is not exactly hypertrophy. Like I, it could be something you know, related to that, but still not quite, you know, more active myosin units uh, or in cross bridges, you know. Um, but if it's making the RM go up, then that's the thing that we care about. You know, it's just, it's just kind of an extreme, uh, an extreme way of looking at keeping the goal the goal. Mm 
-hmm. To that point, I have two contrasting scenarios for you to interpret mm -hmm. and then we can wrap this thing up. Sure. So in the first one, again, this is all in the context of keeping the goal, the goal that's estimated one RM going up. We don't really care if it's because you were doing doubles or you were doing sets of eight. Like we want to see progress in this measure that we care about the most, but, but to that point, have you let's, let's take an individual and, and you can expand on your experiences here an individual whose one RM goes down in these quote unquote hypertrophy blocks and, you know, go obviously that going down the short term leads us to believe that like things aren't really working, but then again, like, you know, if two blocks later, their one RM goes up, like, it's like, I don't know, did, did something good happen like two blocks ago where it was going down that added to this or you know or is it completely unrelated so in that sense like depending on how you interpret that that could mean throwing out those hypertrophy blocks kind of all together we're kind of keeping it in and, and then reassessing but that that's a lot of time that's a lot of weeks of training and then assessing it as a whole to figure out what's going on like how how would you interpret that or i guess have you seen lifters where their one rm their estimated one RM goes down these hypertrophy blocks, but you kind of figure out along the way that that was actually conducive to future adaptations. Yeah, I, I've had similar scenarios. I don't, I'm trying to think of one where the one RM actually went down during- Or at the, least just stayed the same. Yeah, like there yeah, wasn't any I've progress. I definitely had hypertrophy blocks that didn't seem to do anything all that special, but they can end up part of a sequence. Okay, so if the if our goal is to maximize performance on the competition day, then the thing that, I suppose this is an assumption, but I think it's a good one. Um, to me, the, the thing that's most likely to have a large impact on that is the training done immediately prior. You know, the training done in closest proximity, that last training block is most likely to have the biggest impact on your performance right now. You know, and the further you go into, into the past, the less likely it is to have an impact on what's going on at the current moment. So I think from that perspective, that's kind of where I run out of time in most of my ES presentations, right? Like we've got to get to, you know, why uh, would we develop the development blocks this way? Uh, you know, the block review process, and then, you know, hey, you're coming up on competition, so we pull your greatest hits and so on. So that gets you the ideal training block for going into the competition. But then the other training blocks can be important too. Uh, but in what way are they important? You know, you can notice that there's a certain sequence that seems to have a better effect than other sequences. So I've had a handful of lifters who have that type of thing where we would, so normally, uh, sorry, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So apologies if this is kind of confusing. Normally, the way we would structure going into a competition would be uh, that last block prior to competition, you replay your greatest hits. So you're looking at your block reviews and you find this is the stuff that produces the best 1RMs. So we're going to do that stuff in the block immediately prior. I call that the, the tier one movements, the tier one protocols, like that's your best stuff. And usually in the block prior, you would do your tier two stuff. It's the stuff right that comes right after it in the block reviews, you know, that uh, uh, still produces a very considerably strong response, but you know maybe not quite as good. Um, and most people don't have enough stuff that they respond really positively to to get to a tier three. So you know it's usually tier one and tier two. Those are your last two blocks prior to competition. Um, I have had a few lifters where 
having a hypertrophy block isn't necessarily, the hypertrophy work isn't necessarily tier two, but having that prior to the tier one seems to make the tier one better. So we'll, we'll do that. But that, that's not something that happens a lot for me. Now, it's also difficult to see. So that, that means a couple things. One is that it must not be producing a ginormous effect. Otherwise, it would be fairly easy to see. Um, so it's not easy to see. So maybe I'm missing it. Maybe it is a more common response and, and I don't notice it. Uh, but one way or another, it doesn't seem to be a, a really large effect. I think that's a long way, a long answer to your question. Though. No, that, that's very interesting. And, and the process of examining that data and how you use it will, will apply to the following scenario too, which mm -hmm. at least is a bit closer to home for me because when I was competing in powerlifting, I was coaching other local powerlifters. And I mean, I had a group of like eight, powerlifters who I coach for multiple years consistently. And, and during that time, uh, I implemented some emerging strategy stuff, but, but overall it was definitely more a type of block periodization. So there might be some heavy stuff in there, but there was like this higher volume phase and, and then tapering yeah. that, that down over time. And something that I thought was interesting, and, and I would love to hear if you notice anything similar is that there would be people who you know, there's a lot of potential moving variables here, but their estimated 1RM would shoot up in those volume phases and be really impressive. Mm -hmm. But then when it would come to like peaking time, maybe it was like a test in the gym or even competition where like nothing really happened. Like it wasn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't what we expected. And again, there's a lot of moving variables, like how, how long was their training following that you know, volume phase and, and maybe there's too much time in between or not enough or everything else. But I always found it interesting that some people would respond really well in terms of their estimated 1RM for, you know, pushing those sets of like eight and, mm -hmm. and so on. But then come game time, you know, the stuff we really care about, which is the actual 1RM on the bar on game day, sure. it was like, oh, this, it didn't, it didn't go like we expected whatsoever. Have you noticed anything like that? Um, It depends or, or is on when the, the or is when like the estimated one RM goes up like just more or less you're like yeah this this is doing what it's supposed to do. Let me so a, a lot of the details there are going to sway things considerably. So it could be inaccuracy in the estimation, you know, and we know that estimations derived from high reps are less accurate than than low reps. And there's some things that we can do to mitigate that you know, custom RPE charts and stuff like that. And that's great. Uh, but if you're including something like a single at eight RPE, that's probably the thing that you'd want to use to derive the estimation anyway. And if I'm getting good estimations, I'm usually not terribly surprised. You know, like the peaking, the peaking process happens about how I expect it to most of the time. And it, there's some variability just because humans are humans, um, but I wouldn't say like I've been really surprised by a performance being wildly up or down, you know, if we're using kind of a, a traditional ES peaking approach. Um, if we're, it, it would depend also on how like you structure the, the block model. If we're talking about like an accumulation block, and a lifter responding really well to that, it, you know, estimated war RM is very high. We might have problems with the accuracy of the estimation, depending on how that's derived. But then there's two other blocks following where we might be doing something that the lifter is not responding to, or we've changed some variable that's having a negative effect, you know, and then the estimation is going down. So. I think it's important to continually monitor that estimation. And lots of, I coach a lot of people who notice this type of effect with sumo deadlifting, right? That their sumo deadlifting when they're training with lighter weights or high reps uh, seems just monstrous. But then as the weight gets heavier, it dies quickly, you know, and they just weren't expecting that. 
And once you get to where you're expecting that, then you, you can be more accurate with your estimations. Um, but I mean, you would have to tell me, if it, you know, I'm guessing at what's possibly the, the issue without, you know, full context, you know? Yeah, no, I, I completely understand, but those are great points and, and food for thought for the listeners and the coaches out there who are, you know, trying to analyze their lifters data and, and figure out where to go from there. But uh, Mike T, that that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, let, let's plug some of your social media. And if uh, RTS has any projects coming out in the near future, let us oh, know. Oh, absolutely. Man, there's, there's so much stuff going. <laughs> that's exciting. Yeah, yeah, it's good stuff, you know. So um, places to find us, uh, I'm Mike Tushir on Instagram and Reactive Training Systems on Instagram. We've got a YouTube channel. Uh, if you go to reactivetrainingsystems.com, there's a training log application there. Uh, it's free for anybody to use. Uh, you just log in, you click on training log apps and you're there. And um, you know you can use that. You can run the block reviews that I keep talking about. Uh, you run the meta block review. And our aim with that is really to give you information you can use to make better training decisions. You know, there's a workout plan that helps you put the right weight on the bar. You know, um, yeah. So um, that's all there for anybody to use that that wants it. Stuff coming up. Probably the biggest thing coming up is in what are we now? A week and a half away from uh, launching uh, an RTS community uh, membership that I specifically want to make available for like the self-coach lifter. Like I'm a self-coach lifter, There's a special place in my heart for people that, you know, just want to figure it out, you know? And, uh, you know, of course anybody can, can be a part of this community, but, uh, you know, when I'm designing new things for it, you know, I'm kind of thinking about it from that perspective. So some things, some things that are going on with it, uh, we've, probably the biggest thing is the office hours component. Uh, the RTS coaching staff is uh, staffing office hours several times a week. I think they're at all different times. So I've got a calendar uh, with all the times scheduled. Um, so you could just jump on a call, pick, somebody's brain about, you know, like a training strategy that you're thinking about running or help, get some help interpreting a block review, or, uh, get some technique advice or anything like that. Um, just jump on a call and, and ask us questions any, whenever it works for you. Uh, but we're also bringing in subject matter experts from outside of RTS. Uh, we're working currently with uh, Dr. Mike Soya uh, to do like rehab, return to play, physical therapy types of things. Uh, we're working with Dr. Megan Bryanson for biomechanics. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Landon Hickmont doing uh, velocity-based training. Shane Martin's helping us with uh, equip lifting. So there's lots and lots of these office hours type sessions where you can jump on and, and pick somebody's brain and, and get really good advice that's relevant to where you're at. And uh, then we've set up a, a social network as well. It's uh, you, you can think of it like Facebook groups, but without Facebook. Uh, so it's it's off of the traditional social media platforms because I know that some people are trying to stay away from stuff like that. But it's still uh, fun to use. It's feature rich and and uh, it's a good way to continue those types of conversations and discussions. So clearly, I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah. So I, I hope it uh, hope it turns out well. And uh, we've been doing some kind of trials with our coaching clients uh, and some classroom students over the last several months. Um, yeah, yeah. For like classroom folks, if you're interested in like ongoing discussions, you know, that's that's definitely a place to get it. So uh, I'll quit going on and on about it from there. But uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm pumped about it. That sounds incredible. I will be sure to link those up in the show notes for all the listeners, but that does it for another episode of the Muscle Memoirs podcast. Thanks for joining us, everyone.